Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting Harvesting Happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship, nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. This conversation originally aired in December of 2021. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about spiritual mastery, exploring divinity and numinosity. My guest today is Rabbi Wayne Dosick, who teaches and counsels about faith, ethical values, life transformations, and evolving human consciousness. He is the rabbi of the Elijah Minion, a retired visiting professor at the University of San Diego, and the host of the monthly internet radio program Spirit Talk Live, heard on HealthyLife.net. He is the author of Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People, and Rabbi Wayne is in the house. Thanks for being with me today, Rabbi. Hey, great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, It's a great pleasure. Let's talk about... You and I spoke briefly before we got started about how, for some people, the G word can be a challenge, and religion, perhaps in its most organized sense, can be a challenge. But this idea of spirituality and having connection to something greater than oneself is probably one of the roots of happiness. Well, it is. If people don't like organized religion, they should come to my synagogue. We're so disorganized that we would fit, they would fit right in. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're right. Uh, I, I'm, a, look, look, I'm a rabbi. I'm a practicing Jew. I taught for 17 years at the Catholic University here. I'm deeply into religious belief and practice. Uh, and I look at the world and I see that it is so well-reasoned and so well-arranged that for me, it can't be accidental or coincidental. So I call the creator of that universe and of me and of you, I call that God. Others are more comfortable calling a force or an energy or a light of the universe. And it's perfectly fine, whatever whatever we do. The one difference is that a force or an energy or a light does not necessarily have with it an ethical perspective. So God is, for me, not only the creator and the recreator and the maintainer, but God is also the source of the ethical values and the ethical injunctions by which I live. And so God is not a neutral force in the universe. God, for me, is a loving decently kind, gracious, graceful creator and maintainer. And I would ask anyone who doesn't see it that way to understand, to try to understand where the unethical value system comes from if it doesn't come from the divine. Well, when we look at the title of your book, Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People, What I glean from that title and from actual, you know, context of the book is that you're talking about one source. That's correct. The theme song of the world these days seems seems to be, my God's better than your God. (laughs) And if you don't believe me, I'll force you to believe me or I'll terrorize you if you don't believe me. The reality is that there is one God who is the one creator of us all. 
And God says to us, I created you. I am your parent. I love you all. I don't play favorites. I hope you will love me, and I hope you will learn to love each other because we are all one family. We are all children of the universe, and fighting and with each other over the slight differences in the way you call me or the way you approach me or the way you celebrate me or the way you curse me, those are all just simple physical manifestations. It is not the core depth of the spiritual relationship that we have. So let's jump to that spiritual relationship, because I think many listeners may question, you know, their their own faith or their own experience of spirituality, or perhaps they say, it's never worked for me. So many bad things have happened in my life. How could there possibly be a God? Well, God is the everything of the everything. So if God is the everything of the everything, then everything is within God. So if you picture a beach ball, and this takes you back to my most recent book before this book, which is called The Real Name of God. But if you picture a beach ball, uh, each and every one of the panels of the beach ball, the different colored panels of the beach ball, is one attribute or aspect or manifestation uh, or behavior of God. And so there is, God is both male and female, good and evil, right and wrong. Um, and so God says, look at the panel of my beach ball that is the, the good one and choose that more than you choose evil. Choose the panel of my beach ball that is all inclusive and not, and not exclusive. So everything, everything is of God. Every human being, this desk that I'm sitting at is of God, the rock, the tree. The whole universe is of God. Everything, everything, everything is of God. And when tragedy comes our way, as it will in every life, it's part of the ongoing process of the universe that God created. And instead of being mad at God, the psalm says, out of the depths, call out to God, because God, in, in your discomfort and in your sadness or in your grief, God is weeping with you and ready to hold you and comfort you. I think that's very beautiful. And I think that there are also people who are skeptical, particularly now because there's so much war and strife and separation in the name of God. You know, that's the problem. That is the problem. That's the problem, and that's the reason that I wrote this book. One God, one world, one people. So God says to us, stop fighting. Stop being silly over a piece of land or another dollar in your treasury or um, a bit of power or prestige in your area. Understand that you are all my children, and what happens to one of you happens to every one of you. So if there is one hungry person in this world, every person is hungry because we are all interconnected in that deep, deep way. But how do we communicate this to our fellow humanity. You believe this. I may believe this. My neighbor might believe it. But then there's that guy across the street or that gal across the street that doesn't believe it. And the peace, you know, that 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 notion of peace starts with us at the individual level. Yes, you're absolutely right. I've been called naive and I've been called idealistic and I've been called foolish and I've been called, you know, a 60s idealist. And the reality <laughs> is you're all right. You're but all those things. We're all those what, things. What's the alternative? The alternative has gotten us absolutely nowhere. The alternative has gotten us war and bloodshed, filled the earth with the blood of human beings and filled the cemeteries of all our countries with the flowers of our youth. What we have been doing up until now has not worked. And that's why everything, everything, everything is falling apart because the world cannot continue to move forward, what we call in spiritual terms from the 3D world to the 5D world, if we hang on with our fingernails to what has been. And that's why there's such fear and such fundamentalism, because those who are comfortable with the old are very, very afraid of the new. So they hang on to the old with all they have. But the reality is we are moving into a new world, a world 
of enlightenment, a world of uh, goodness and kindness and decency and dignity. And the, the sooner we move there, all of us will be so much better off. And so if this hasn't worked for you so far, my question is what has worked better? The answer, my answer is nothing. So you have <laughs> nothing to lose by trying this and coming along with me to a world of oneness consciousness. We are all one. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head about fear. And I think the fear is of, of change, right? That the world is radically changing because we have so much technology and information available to us and people are frightened of change. It's hard to change. Sure it is. And uh, therefore, um, the fundamentalists hang on and they say, do it my way because we've always done it this way. Do it my way because I'm most comfortable with this. Do it this way because uh, I don't know how to leap onto the unknown uh, without being afraid. And, you know, it, very interestingly, in the Bible, the, the Jewish Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, the word in, in different grammatical forms, the phrase, do not be afraid, is used more than 300 times. Really? And that's because we're all afraid. We yeah. respond to, we, we talk about what we are responding to. So the only way, the only way to respond to fear and to anger and to hatred is through love. Love is the only thing that will cure, that will respond to uh, fear and hatred and bigotry and discrimination. It is reaching out one human being to another to understand that we are all one. And the way I see it, is that we are all created in the image of God. And if I look into the mirror, not physically, of course, but spiritually, I see the face of God. And if I look at you, if I look at you, then I see the face of God. And if you look at me, this is what the uh, Sanskrit means by namaste. Yes. Uh, the divine in me acknowledge, sees and divide, acknowledges the divine in you. And so if I look in the face of another being and I see the face of God, my only response again is profound love. And this practice that you speak of, and I do think it's a practice because we, we don't do this 100% of the time, although many of us aspire to it, but that practice does create a softening in that story. You know, being able to do this practice is very spiritual, especially when it's somebody that we think we don't like. Sure. So on the simplest way, walk into the bank on Friday afternoon to make a quick deposit or get some cash for the weekend. And the line is 10 people long and the, cl the clerk is taking forever and you get angry and you get frustrated. Or you walk into a convenience store and the teenage clerk can't make change for a dollar bill without <laughs> using his calculator. Um, instead of being angry and frustrated at those in those situations, and these are the simplest of all situations, uh, that see the face of God in another human being, and maybe that person is struggling with an issue that day, or doesn't know how to make a change for a dollar bill, or is doing her very best, but the person in, in front of you in line is asking for 12 different transactions at the bank that day. Look at that person the way you would like to be looked at, with some compassion. You know, compassion, the word compassion means walking with another in equal step. And so walk with another in equal step and walk with someone who is in pain or who has a need or even something you don't understand. I'll tell you a quick story, if I may. Let's take a break and then you can tell me the quick story because we need to take a pause. We're going to come back. We're going to take that pause and then we're going to return to the conversation with Rabbi Wayne Dosick to learn more about Rabbi's work and his books particularly Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People, please vis visit, I'm going to say that again, Eric, sorry, please visit ElijahMinion.com slash Rabbi Wayne. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is guaranteed. Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for nutritious helpings of positive goodness. 
One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And at times, we all need a little support. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and at the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com to explore experiential online and on-site optimal lifestyle management consulting services, including recovery fortification and life crisis triage. And we're back continuing the conversation with Rabbi Wayne Dosick. We're talking about spiritual mastery, exploring divinity and numinosity. Let's get back to it. So Rabbi Wayne, I cut you off when you were about to tell a story, and that's probably not a good thing to do to a rabbi. So take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a radio host, I know when the segue to break comes. So I was, uh, <laughs> I was gonna, uh, le- and before we uh, tell you the story, let me offer an, an additional website uh, about this b- book in particular. It's called RadicalLovingBook.com. Perfect. So you can find out much, much more about the, the this book on that website. So when my kids were little, they're old now, uh, we tried to put into effect an ancient practice in modern times. It is said of an ancient sage that when he wanted, when he went to the market, if he needed a, a piece of meat, he would buy two. If he needed a bunch of vegetables, he would buy two, one for himself and one for the hungry in his neighborhood. So we translated that into modern times by saying every time we went to the market, we would buy one extra item of non-perishable food. A box of cereal, a box of mac and cheese, a can of tuna fish, a a jar of peanut butter, a jar of jelly. And we wouldn't even take it into the house. We would leave it in the grocery sacks in the trunks of the car. And when we collected two or three or four bags, we would take it to the local um, food pantry. Well, I'm in the store one day with uh, my son, who was about five at the time. He's in his late 40s now, so it's an old story, but it's so true. And I took a box of cereal from the shelf and I said to him, honey, how about this as our food gift today? And um, he looked at me and said, no, and grabbed the box of cereal off from my hands, put it back on the shelf, stood on his little tippy toes and took a different box of cereal from the shelves. And he said, look, dad, this will be our food gift for today. And I said to him, honey, what's the difference? And he said, look, there are hungry kids out there, too, and kids like Sugar Frosted Flakes better than we like Cheerios. <laughs> now, in an instant, in an instant, that child taught me to see not a category of people, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, the needy, but he taught me to see the face of a child, probably his age, whom we were helping to not be so hungry by our food gift that week. And so when we look into the face of another, if we see the face of God, we then meet the needs of that person as well. So, for example, another example, when we all give away clothes to Goodwill or the the homeless shelter, and we give away a pair of pants or a blouse or a shirt or a skirt that no longer fits or is no longer in fashion, you know, if a, a, a man needs a pair of pants, He probably also needs a pair of socks, but no one thinks to give away a pair of socks. Uh, They're old, they're smelly, they're dirty. So when when you're on your way to the homeless shelter to uh, contribute your clothes, uh, stop off at the local store and buy a couple of pair of socks and add it to the pile that you're bringing. It is a great, great need of people in homeless shelters. You see the face of another human being by seeing the face of God. Well, let's talk about that face of God. First of all, I want to just uh, talk about the power of giving, you know, what it means to actually to give, you know, to give from the heart to a cause or to people or to a group. It does cause personal elevation as well as doing good. So if we're talking about harvesting happiness, certainly the idea of doing good for somebody else truly matters. But I want to jump back to the face of God, because you mentioned something in the first segment about God as a man, God as a woman, and this is not something that you often hear from religious leaders. And it's it's a bit of a, a bit of a spin here, because what does God really look like? God doesn't look like anything. God is a spirit, a force. If I knew what God looked like, <laughs> that, I'm reminded of the story that the 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 teacher told the kids that the kindergarten kids, they could draw anything they wanted, take a piece of paper and some crayons. So she walked around 
And one kid was drawing a rainbow and one kid was drawing his puppy and one kid was drawing her house. And she came to little Susie and she said, Susie, uh, tell me about your picture. She didn't understand. She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Susie, the teacher said, Susie, nobody knows what God looks like. So they have to, in five minutes when I'm done with my picture, picture, everyone will know what God looks like. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, of course, Which God re- doesn't look like anything. God is the spirit. God is the fourth. God is a creator. God is a, a maintainer. But God is the everything of the everything. So within God is everything we know, male and female. God's not a man. God's not a woman. God is a, a combination of all what we are, who we are, how we are. And actually, misunderstanding that has brought us great grief throughout the years. One of the greatest, if you will, one of the greatest contentions in the world since the beginning, and certainly since the so-called expulsion from Eden, is the, the, the tension between men and women. And so Jung taught us what God has been teaching us. Jung taught us 100 years ago what God's been teaching us for thousands of years. And that is within us, within each and every one of us, is an image of God, which has both me, male and female. And what we're learning now is that men need to get in touch with their their femininity and feel compassion. And women need to get in touch with their masculinity and feel strength. Very well said. I I remember when I had given birth to one of my children, I was in the hospital and one of the nurses had come in late at night and I was laying with, with my baby. And she said to me, she goes, you know, when you look at these babies, you see God. Mm. And I always remembered that because it was very powerful. I'm not a particularly religious person. I have a strong spiritual practice of my own creation, but I do believe that there is, there is something. And I think that when we learn to see that godliness first in ourselves, right? If you can't see the, the the pure preciousness in yourself, you cannot embrace that in the other. And we have to, when you say I'm not a religious person, that's fine because, you know, we created religions. God didn't right. create religions. And religion, the creation of religion uh, is just about a particular place or time or ethnicity or culture or social mores. Uh, God... Um, is God says to us, I'm the parent of you all. And just like in any family, somebody may say daddy and somebody may say pop and somebody may, may say mama and somebody say mommy. I don't care what you call me. You can call me anything, nor do I care the way you approach me. Approach me in, in joyous singing, approach me in silence, approach me uh, gaily decorating the pathway or uh, austerely walking. It doesn't matter. You are all my children. I love you all. You, I don't play favorites. And however you call me, however you approach me, is the spiritual path. Because ultimately, a spiritual path is not a particular religious or faith community. But a spiritual path has two very simple places. It begins from God, and it continues until we return to God. I want to ask you a question um, about the 5D world. Because in the earlier segment, you had spoken about the shift from the 3D world to the 5D world. Mm -hmm. And many of our listeners might not know what that is, myself included. 5D is Eden on Earth once again. It's that simple. 5D is a world of oneness, of oneness consciousness, of uh, love and respect and compassion and kindness and grace and generosity of spirit. That's the world to which we are moving and the world of uh, hatred and bigotry and discrimination and war is falling bit by bit, a little bit by a little bit. And then once again, you'll call me silly and idealistic and naive. So I would just call your attention. You remember back to 1987 to what we called the harmonic convergence? Yes, I do. <laughs> so we were all still, I, we were all still young and naive, and we decided that we would hold hands, stand around the whole world, hold hands, sing songs, and bring peace. And the world just laughed at us. But, you know, within two years of that harmonic convergence, the Soviet Union fell, the satellite countries fell, the Berlin Wall came down, blacks and whites started riding the bus together in Johannesburg, Protestant and Catholics started shooting each other in Northern Ireland, and once in a while, 
Israelis and Arabs sat down at a peace table. Now, did we do that? Probably not. But what we did do is we sent the love vibration out to the world. You know, if I send the vibration of of hate or fear out to the world, that's what will spiral around and come back to me. But if I send a love of a vibration of love out to the world, that's what will spiral and come back. And if it comes back to me, we have the good hope that it's going to enter other people's hearts as well. Because we're told it's metaphoric, of course, but the seraphim who surround the heavenly throne in the metaphoric heaven, what do they do all day? They just chant, holy, 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 sanctus, 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 uh, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. And that sends the love vibration to us. We catch it and spiral the love vibration around the world and back to the heavens. That's how we move forward. And this is this is radical loving in action. And this is this is your point that when we're able to do that, what am I trying to say? Jump in here. That we, we're we're practicing this radical loving. It's for the the greater good, the highest good, and the best yield for all. Exactly. And so you know, I wrote this book as aspirational. Here's what can happen. And then we were smacked with the reality of COVID. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the, the issues of aspiration became issues of daily survival. Do I care only for myself and my little family? Uh, do I say I want to open my business, my pizza parlor, or my dry cleaning store, my nail salon, because I, I want to feed my family? Or do I want to, the businesses to open so I can go to a bar and drink and go to the beach and get a suntan? The common, the 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 individual good, or knee, uh, or or uh, uh, versus the common good, the greatest good, the highest good, and we have been faced with that right now, and the people, the, the vaccination issue is exactly the same. Do I get vaccinated to protect myself and the people around me, or do I, does my quote individual right and freedom supersede, and I can do whatever I want, even though. It might be dangerous to myself and dangerous to those around me. You know, I, I I must say, I don't understand people who choose not to be vaccinated. They choose to stop at red lights to regulate society. I don't understand why we don't vaccinate to regulate society. <laughs> That's a, that is a perfect end point. <laughs> To learn more about Rabbi Wayne Dosick, please go to ElijahMinion.com slash Rabbi hyphen Wayne. The book we've been talking about today is Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People. Rabbi Wayne, you come and hang out with me anytime to talk about God and anything else, because this is such good fun for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And and as I say, you know, I'm interviewed in a lot of places and I do a lot of interviewing. You ask great questions. This was a wonderful, wonderful interview for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Me too. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Rabbi Wayne Dosick, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.